In 2012, a 21-year-old rap artist, Irving McKinnis, died in a car accident. His final message came from his Twitter account. Drunk AF, going 120, drifting corners, YOLO. This happened in the United States, so the 120 in, is in miles per hour, which means he was going at close to 200 km per hour. A few minutes later, his car ran a red light, skidded out of control, and slammed into a wall. All five persons in the car died in the accident. Perhaps that's your impressions towards the acronym YOLO, you only live once, an excuse for young, heedless people to take unnecessary risks for the thrill and excitement. Actually, YOLO is not a new thing thought out by the younger generation. Remember the Latin phrase carpe diem, seize the day? This phrase can be traced back 2,000 years ago, back in the time of the Roman world. The idea is to enjoy and make full use of the day because you don't know what tomorrow will bring. YOLO is really just a contemporary expression of the ancient phrase. Even though most of us will not choose to take risks and live life on the edge, subconsciously, we are all living out the essence of YOLO. Let me ask you, what is on your bucket list? What are the things that you want to do before you kick the bucket? Maybe it is to travel to certain exotic countries, earn $1 million, buy a dream house or a car, or find the love of your life. I once talked to a teenager and I asked him if he was ready to die. He replied, no way, I'm not even married. If we are honest, our life has become just about fulfilling those items on our bucket list. We are mindful that life is short, so we devote our time and energy towards maximizing pleasure. Christianity likewise tells us that we only live once, but there is life after death. We don't cease to exist after our physical death, and what we do in this lifetime will have an effect on the next. To all the friends who are watching this right now, thank you for taking time out to join us online. Maybe some of you are skeptical about this life after death. You are thinking, how do I know if this life after death is true? After all, no human being has ever come back from the dead to verify this life after death. That's a good question. Let's keep this conversation for the next time. For now, I want to submit to you that the Christian message, if you would open your heart to it, confer us worth, honour and purpose unlike any other worldview. Today, I want to lead us into understanding the kind of purpose-driven life that Christianity prescribes by referring to a parable in the Bible taught by Jesus Christ himself. Are you guys ready? Then let's go. Let's read from Matthew chapter 25, verse 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven would be like ten virgins who took their lambs and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them five were wise. The foolish ones took their lambs but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom! Come out to meet him! Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. They may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourself. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins were ready, went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Not quite a straightforward story to understand, so let's do this together, shall we? From this parable, I want to share with you three things that we can do to live a purpose-driven life. Okay, and number one is about relationship. So, know Him. Let's deal with the most mind-boggling part of this parable first, okay, which is the ending. Come, let's read that part again. Okay, verse 10. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins were ready, went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. 
Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Wow, what a crazy turn of event. Imagine, imagine, you are invited to be part of your friend's wedding entourage, which is what those virgins were doing, okay, bridesmaids for the wedding. On the day of wedding, you forgot to collect your outfit from the dry cleaning. You, quick, you quickly rush down to the laundry shop, get changed, plow through the massive traffic jam, and finally arrive at a wedding banquet two hours late. Phew, better late than ever. But instead of welcoming you to your table, the bridegroom closes the door in, in your face and says, truly I tell you, I don't know you. I'm sure you'll be like, what? I can understand if you are upset with me for being late, I'm sorry. But hey, didn't you invite me to your wedding? Now you say you don't know me. That's like, that's like little children saying, I don't friend you anymore. What is this all about? To appreciate this parable, we need to bear in mind that this story was originally spoken to the Jews, the people of the nation of Israel. Israel was God's chosen, na chosen nation, and the Jews had assumed on the basis of that fact that they would be accepted into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus shared this parable in the context of his extended teaching called the Olivet Discourse, found in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. And right before the Olivet Discourse, he was criticizing the religious leaders, the supposed most religious people of the day. Okay, let's read that quickly in Matthew chapter 23. Verse 27. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to, be, to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. You snakes! You brood of vipers! How will you escape from being condemned to hell? Intense and sobering words. Imagine somebody in church saying this to your face. Outwardly, the Pharisees did all the right things and led an exemplary life. But inwardly, they were not interested in knowing and becoming more like the God they preach about. So what Jesus was doing in the parable was to compare the Jews to the virgins. Everybody in the nation of Israel was chosen and invited to enter the kingdom of heaven but only some responded to the invitation. So when Jesus said, truly I tell you, I don't know you, he is not saying, I'm severing ties with you. He is really saying, I never knew you since the start. You never had a relationship with me to begin with. If you're new to Christianity, I want to let you know that being a Christian is not primarily about doing, but knowing. Knowing and having a relationship with the God of the Bible. No amount of work and good deeds can gain you the favour from God that only comes by having a relationship with Him. But you might say, wow, all these talks about judgment and condemnation to hell are so horrible. God does not seem at all loving. If anything, He come across to me as sadistic. That's a fair viewpoint, but let me ask you, why do you think the Bible deliberately includes so many warnings against judgment and condemnation to hell? Do you think God is interested in punishing people? No, not at all. The warnings are there precisely because God does not want anyone to perish, but to have eternal life. These warnings are an extension of His great love for us. The Creator of the heaven and the earth wants to have a relationship with you. And that is the best thing that you can do with your life, to accept his friend request and know him personally and intimately. Now, this message is not just for our non-Christian friends, but for the professing Christians as well. The question that we need to keep coming back is, do I have an ongoing, loving relationship with God? Or am I trying to do all the right things so that I can earn his favour and blessings? Maybe you have been attending church for many years now and you realize that you were only interested in the doing, not the knowing. 
The good news is that wherever you are today, you can make the commitment to grow in your relationship with God. Continue to do it or cultivate. Remember, His heart is already for you. That's the first thing we can do to live a purpose-driven life. The second thing we can do is about readiness. Okay, and that is to serve Him. Coming back to our parable today, what do you think was the difference between the wise and the foolish virgins? All 10 of them were invited to the wedding. All 10 of them each brought a lamb. And in fact, there was oil in every lamb. So what was the difference? Come, let's read the parts of the, Bible, of the parable again. Verse 3, The foolish ones took their lamb but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. And the parable ended with Jesus saying in verse 13, Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. You would think that the phrase keep watch means to stay awake, right? Like doing gut duty. But guess what? All 10 of them fell asleep while waiting. So, what is the difference? The difference is that the five wise virgins brought extra oil in jars, ready to reload their lamps before the light go out. So those extra jars of oil seems to be the game changer. But how do we make sense of what it means? Now, different people might have different takes and interpretation on this parable, but I think the best way to look at this parable is to look at it from its original context, like what we did just now. Immediately after this parable of the ten virgins, Jesus proceeded to share two more stories. Okay, and together, all three stories share a similar narrative. Let's keep reading and find out. The first story after the parable of the ten virgins is the parable of the bags of ghosts. Okay, in summary, it tells of a rich man entrusting his wealth to his three servants before going on a long journey. He eventually came back after a long time and settled accounts with his servants. Let's see how the story unfolds. In verse 19, After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The master proceeded to give the same approval to the second servant. But as to the third servant, who did not do anything with the gold entrusted to him, the master threw him into the darkness. The end. Similar ending to the parable of the ten virgins. And the story immediately after this is the story of the sheep and the goats. Okay, now this story is not quite a parable because it is most likely an actual event that will happen in the future. So in summary, it tells of the time when the Son of Man eventually comes, he will gather people from all nations before him and he will separate them into two groups the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. Okay, let's see what he says to those on the right. Then, then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was ill, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And the righteous will answer him, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When do we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. What do you think the king says to the goats on the left? He condemned them for not giving a helping hand to the downs and outs. 
and he put them into eternal punishment. Can you see the similar narrative that runs through all three stories? All three stories talk about the return of an authority figure. They highlight the importance of laboring diligently before his return. And they tell us the consequences for both the action and the inaction. So, the parable of the ten virgins is really about readiness. The foolish virgins did not bother to prepare beforehand. I mean, if, how will you feel right, if your wedding helpers only purchase the necessary logistics on the day of your wedding? It says a lot about how much they care about the wedding or about you. The wise virgins, on the other hand, did the hard work of buying extra oil before the wedding and they were ready for the bridegroom to come at any time. Here's the point for us. Think about all your achievements in your career, the things you put on LinkedIn, the awards you have received, and the accolades you have accumulated. Think about your possessions, the money in your bank, the car you're driving, the branded items you own, and the house you stay in. I know, inside you, you are thinking that you want to have more. But guys, we can't bring all these things with us to the next life. Hey, don't get me wrong, all these things are good. But if our purpose in life is to gather as much as we can, to enjoy as hard as we can, then one day we will realize that all these things don't matter at all. We need a better purpose in life. And Christianity gives us the better purpose to life. And that is to serve God and be ready for Him. Notice in all three stories there's a reward given to those who labor diligently while waiting. In the parable of the ten virgin, it is the opportunity to join the wedding banquet. In the parable of the bags of ghosts, it is sharing in the master's happiness. And in the story of the sheep and the goats, the reward is an inheritance. But not just any normal inheritance, it is a kingdom prepared since the creation of the world. Even though we cannot bring our earthly possessions with us to the next life, we can stop rewards, treasures, and the happiness of God in heaven. And the best part, we get to enjoy all of this for all eternity. Early on, I mentioned that Christianity is, about, is primarily about knowing, not doing. But here's the thing. When we know and love God, we will naturally want to do all the things to serve Him. We will want to use our resources to bless people. We will want to help the disadvantaged and needy people around us. We will want to tell as many people as possible about the goodness of Jesus Christ before He returns. And the best part, we will please the heart of God and He will reward us lavishly. That's the second thing. The third and final thing that we can do to live a purpose-driven life is about reunion. Look forward to Him. The parable of the ten virgins ends on a somber note. The door slamming shut in their faces with the bridegroom saying he does not know them. If this is all to the Christian message, then I think we will walk away feeling very fearful. Do this or you will end up like the foolish virgins. Yes, this parable is meant to send a shockwave through our system to wake us up from our slumber. But its purpose is not to instill fear, but to inspire love. Okay, to appreciate this parable even more, I think we need one more piece of background information. In ancient times, a typical Jewish marriage was a three-part event spread out over many months. Step one was a legal engagement contract, usually arranged by the parents and sealed with the payment of a bridal price. Step two was the betrothal period. Okay, the couple would have a public ceremony where they exchange vows. After that, for the next one year or so, the husband would build a home where the couple would stay, start their lives together. Okay, in other words, the man has one year to build his own BTO flat. How about that? The point to note is that during the betrothal period, the marriage was fully binding and could only be dissolved by divorce even though the couple had yet to consummate their, consummate their marriage. And step three was the wedding banquet. 
the banquet was usually held at the bride's home. Only after the wedding banquet would the bride go to her husband's home. But before the banquet, the husband would leave the bride for a time to prepare their new home. But they will be reunited when he comes back to receive her. Guys, can you see where I'm going with this? We are not just called to be ready like the wise virgins. We are also the bride in the parable. Jesus, God himself, came 2,000 years ago to betroth the people to himself. And he will come a second time in the near future to marry her. That's us, his church. And take us to our new BTO, our new home of love and joy forever. Maybe you're hearing this concept of the church being the bride and Jesus being the bridegroom for the first time. And you're like, wait, what? God marrying his people? That's almost as warped as Zeus in the Greek mythology. John Piper puts it this way. King Jesus came into the world to take a wife, not a harem, and not for sex, but to give her pleasures that make sex taste like cardboard. You see, God is abstract. The analogy of marriage in the Bible is to convey the intensity of his love for his people. And do you know why it's the bridal price that Jesus paid to betroth his church? With his blood. When Jesus died on the cross, he entered a marital covenant with us. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5 tells us this. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Today, whenever a bride-to-be is preparing for her wedding, she will have to purchase many expensive items to make herself beautiful on that day, like the bridal gown, the heels, the jewellery and cosmetics. You know something? Our bridegroom purchased our beauty with his blood. We were marred by sin. We were dirty, repulsive. We don't deserve to be noticed by the Holy God. But Christ came. With his blood, he made us beautiful in the eyes of God and he betrothed us. Today, he is telling us, hasta la vista, baby. Okay, maybe drop the baby. He is telling us, I'll be back. I'm coming back to bring you to our new home. I love you so much and I cannot wait to be reunited with you. Guys, do you know that there's going to be a huge wedding banquet when we get to heaven? Revelation 19 tells us this. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. We are going to be reunited with our bridegroom. We are going to have the biggest party ever. We are going to have the best time of our life, and we are going to enjoy His presence for all eternity. So, from now till then, how should this promise change our present outlook to life? It does not matter if you have a chronic disease. It does not matter if you lost a job and your family has to live with much lesser. It does not matter if you are falling behind in progression compared to your peers. It does not matter if your child is not doing well or you can't have a child of your own. It does not matter if your marriage breaks down or you can't find the love of your life. Now, don't get me wrong. All these are so, so painful that I wouldn't want to go through them myself. Yet, we know that all these things happen all the time. And this is where the Christian message gives us hope in our pain. We can continue to live a purpose-driven life even while going through pain because we know that our problems will one day end. Not just that, we can look forward in anticipation because our present problems pale in comparison with our future glory. Let me close with this. In the movie Gladiator, which is one of my favourite movies, the main character, Maximus, said this, what we do in life echoes in eternity. 
Guys, we only live once, yet the outcome of what we do in this life will stay with us forever. So let's live our life bearing eternity in mind. And let's get ready for the coming of our bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Come, let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for this amazing, amazing opportunity, not just to be called your children, but to be called your bride, oh God, as somebody whom you dearly love, somebody who, whom you have used the blood to make us beautiful and betroth us as, one, as, your, as, your, as your bride, oh God. We just want to pray that, Lord, that this perspective, this promise, this wonder from your word will just begin to transform the way we look at ourselves, begin to transform the way we look at our lives. Help us, oh God, to remember this all the days of our life. Help us to look with anticipation into the future. And right now, wherever we are, help us to begin to live a purpose-driven life because we know that everything that we do for you in this life will not be done in vain. Because God, we know that Lord, you're watching over us. You are so pleased with us. And whatever we do, oh God, will please the heart even further. So Lord, help us to work from, from approval, knowing that God, we, uh, we, that you have already l- loved us so lavishly, oh God. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say, Amen.